Um, we're going to now go to our next panel, um, and Kasim Shepard is going to introduce the speakers and be the moderator for this panel. Um, Kasim is a, a adjunct assistant professor here in the Urban Design Department. He's also a founder of Urban Omnibus. Thank you, Kasim. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you, Mr. Cox. You're a personal hero of mine, so that was a great, great delight to see that. Um, as Hillary mentioned, my name is Kasim Shepard. I teach here at GSAP a number of courses related to uh, narrative and storytelling, particularly through filmmaking, as well as um, classes on the complex history of the encounter between architecture and poverty. Um, and so I'm delighted to be a part of this um, conference today and this stimulating day of presentations and discussions, as well as this panel in particular, uh, which kind of brings together both of those aspects of, um, of what I look at. Uh, the name of this panel is Livability and Design Excellence, but I think we're really trying here to expand notions of quality and excellence beyond what can just be evaluated in aesthetic terms on opening day of a building, but rather to really try and look at how environments evolve and how we might incorporate the experience critically of users, of residents, of workers, the people who inhabit and dwell in the built environments that we create, um, into that evaluation of how complex built environments work. Um, so we will be joined today by David Brody, who is a professor of design studies at Parsons at the New School. His work, uh, his recent work, focuses on the relationship between design and labor, especially in the context of hotels, and also by Hans Iblings, an architectural historian and critic who teaches at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design at the University of Toronto, and the publisher and editor of the Architecture Observer, and the author of Rise and Sprawl. Um, Rise and Sprawl, the Condominiumization of Toronto. Unfortunately, Lisa Yun Lee, who's the executive director of the Public Housing Museum, uh, the National Public Housing Museum in Chicago, is unable to join us. The blizzard got in the way of her flight from Chicago this morning. Uh, when the National Public Housing Museum opens in the last remaining building of the Jane Addams Houses, it will be the first cultural institution dedicated to interpreting the American experience in public housing. Um, so I am just going to very briefly cycle through her slides in her absence uh, just to really make sure, if it's not already, that the National Public Housing Museum is on your radar and that you visit them the next time you're in Chicago. Uh, one of the things that Lisa and our conversations leading up to today really emphasized um, was not only the physical site uh, in the Jane Addams houses that is sort of a repository of memory, but also the deep outreach and public programming the museum has done um, with constituents, uh, both current and former, of public housing um, in, in the Chicago area. This, I thought, was particularly poignant in light of the Lafayette Park example. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, and really sort of doing deep outreach to lift up not only the sort of physical environments in which um, public housing has taken place, but also uh, the personal stories. And I think storytelling and the, and the role of uh, lifting up the narratives of, of users, I think, is going to be central to any expansion of our conversation about what um, housing environments and other kinds of complex environments can be. Um, so I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to introduce some of those questions into today's conversation, uh, starting with David Brody, who's going to talk to us a little bit about hotels, labor, and how those can influence how we evaluate these things. David? Terrific. First of all, thank you for having me, Hillary and Cassim. I very much appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to talk just for about 13, 14 minutes or so um, today. So my work looks at the ways in which design choices all too often subjugate labor. Specifically, I'm interested in how design decisions um, which directly affect the physical and economic well-being of housekeepers get made really without any regard for the difficult nature of what Hillary Sample describes as cleaning-focused work. Since the majority of hotel housekeepers in the United States are women of color, I contend that there is a racially motivated discourse about hotel workers and a type of cultural disparagement towards what many perceive as the menial nature of these jobs that is implicit in these unfortunate design decisions. This approach to design explicitly affects these women's daily lives. And part of what this book project was about was interviewing um, housekeepers and trying to get at those narratives that was just spoken about. So let's enter uh, one of these hotels I studied. Let's check in, if you will, to a conflict that arose at the Hyatt Regency Chicago eight years ago. 
This conflict was a result of the lapsed contract between Hyatt Management and its Chicago hotel workers represented by Unite Here, which is the big hotel union in the United States. The hotel workers' previous contract went into force on September 1st, 2006, and expired on August 31st, 2009. From 2009 until the ratification of a new contract in 2013, those represented by the union, including the housekeeping staff and many of those in the food and beverage department of the hotel, worked without a contract. This meant a protracted series of conflicts centered on wages and conditions and benefits. So yes, finances and benefits were critical to these labor talks and disputes that went on for four years in Chicago. But housekeepers also protested the recent physical changes to the interior that made their jobs much more demanding. So starting with the west tower of the hotel and then moving to the east tower, the Hyatt Regency Chicago completed the renovation of its 2,019 rooms in 2011. And typically, whenever I talk about the Regency, inevitably there's several people in the room who have stayed at the hotel because it's so enormous and it's such a convention-centric spot. While the guest desires were clearly the driving force behind these design changes, the voices of hotel workers, especially housekeepers, were not included in the design process. The firm Indie Design, based in California, led the $90 million renovation. And I interviewed uh, Beatrice Gorelli, the firm's principal and owner, and her conversation with me, I think, helped shed some light on both their design brief from Hyatt and some of the challenges that went into their enormous project. Gorelli was very open about the tension that exists between corporations like Hyatt and a more ambitious design vision. Often this had to do with finances, and these limitations can affect creativity, since Gorelli's firm does what it can to push the possibility of design into, ter into territory that will, in her words, wow the guest. During my interview with Gorelli, she was frank about housekeeping and concerns that her firm has with the women who clean the spaces she has designed. She noted, quote, we design things that fit in only one place, which makes certain that the room is housekeeping proof. She emphasized that there are many hotels where housekeeping, quote, is the designer. As they move objects, they do not follow the manuals that design firms give to hotels, and they disregard the importance of appearance. To avoid this, Gorelli and her team keep a careful record of where each object should be placed and create a manual for housekeeping, which I was never able to get my hands on, unfortunately, that gives explicit directions about where objects should be kept. So here's a before and after shot, obviously the before on top and the after on the bottom of the renovation. Indie Design's changes at the Regency focused on palette, fixtures, and textures found in the guest rooms. The bed and pillows in the old rooms were multicolored with large vertical light fixtures that were part of the wood headboards. A grid-like pattern defined the overall appearance of the earlier rooms, while Gorelli's new rooms are more monochromatic and less accented with tones of brown. The new lighting fixtures are subtle, and the furniture has cleaner lines without the cluttered look that must have led to the decision to renovate. This is a before and after of the bathroom. The bathrooms extend this motif of cleaner lines with new sinks and vanities in the absence of towel racks. The sinks are now set within a wood base, and underneath the sink there are three towels, you can see that on the right, uh, that instead of hanging from a rack are rolled and tucked out of a line of sight which would be unavoidable with towel racks. Instead of the sink surface extending over the back of the toilet to create a ledge for bathroom products, Indie Design uses a simple ledge where the Hyatt's bath amenities can be placed. In several of the hotel's images of the renovation that appeared at the time, a small bamboo plant, like what you see on the right, um, it sits in a glass jar on the sink, adding to the overall spa-like aesthetic that defines the renovation. So not all of the housekeepers at the Hyatt embraced this renovation, and many noted in the interviews that I had with them that the changes have led to injuries and other difficulties. Several of the housekeepers explained that the new mattresses in the room are heavier and difficult to maneuver, especially in terms of tucking in bottom sheets. And in the hotel industry, mattresses and beds are always the most controversial object. Um, specifically, they've become remarkably more heavy, especially over the course of the last um, of the last decade, and hotels do not use fitted sheets like probably we all do in our home. There's a phobia against fitted sheets in the hotel industry. 
Um, so Gorelli from InDesign noted that Hyatt bought these beds without the consultation of her firm, but the position of the bed, which her firm did devise, is also a point of contention between housekeeping and Hyatt's management. As Anne Small Gonzalez, who was a floor runner in housekeeping, remarked to me, quote, the bed is so close to the wall in order to get that tuck, it's so uncomfortable. I think that's how a lot of people might be getting hurt. They did make changes with that. Another housekeeper, Angela Martinez, further claimed that placing the mattress on a wooden box rather than a box spring, which was in the old rooms, also makes the bed making process far more difficult since the box spring was more flexible than the wooden platform. The new bed also has more pillows than the previous bed. There are now six pillows, according to several of the housekeepers I interviewed. And these fluffier pillows are longer and require more reaching and extending of the housekeeper's arm to place the pillow in its case. And many have complained that this also has led to shoulder and back pain. So another seemingly benign design choice, all these kind of seemingly benign design choices in Chicago meant further complications for the hotel workers at the Hyatt. For instance, the new updated bathrooms have also led to more work. Some of the bathrooms have glass partitions that separate the tub from the rest of the bathroom, and many of the rooms that have shower curtains, um, like the one that you're seeing here, no longer use a plastic liner. So housekeepers have to scrub the white surface that shows even a minuscule amount of dirt. Also, since the towel racks had been removed, housekeepers had to now roll towels and place them underneath the counter below the sink. The towels are hidden from view, achieving the type of clean line aesthetics found throughout the renovated rooms, but by using a napkin as a model, one housekeeper revealed how exacting the rolling process is and how much longer it takes than folding a towel and placing it on a rack. And so all of these small labor changes added up um, to a tremendous additional time in terms of the amount of the work going into each room. So the design decisions created a very tense work atmosphere at the Hyatt Regency Chicago that in part led to the workers taking action. And on May 26, 2010, about 400 employees walked out of the hotel for a brief period of time to protest issues related to the workload increase caused by the renovation. Hyatt and Unite Here's inability to resolve a contract dis dispute exacerbated this issue, of course, and a controversy about the hotel management's refusal to allow a particular union representative into the hotel during a particularly heated moment only made the situation worse. The walkout only lasted a few brief hours, but the stage was set for what continued to be a protracted contract negotiation that had for several employees an enormous impact. In studying this untenable situation amongst the workers, the union, and Hyatt management, it became apparent that something had to change. And then finally, in August of 2013, Hyatt and its employees did reach an agreement at its four Chicago hotels, including the Regency, and signed a contract that was in force until this year. And actually, there was a whole other recent labor dispute that took place this year, which is a, a, a subject of a different uh, topic, uh, but closely related to this, of course. As a result of the 2013 contract, housekeepers would get $1.80 raise per hour, taking their pay to $16.40. And there were also some additional benefits in terms of what the union could protest against and bring up uh, in meetings, um, and also some slight changes to health benefits. But while many of the pressing concerns appear to have been resolved, there was still really the matter of design. There are still the difficulties associated with contending with guest rooms that have not been designed to facilitate the hard work of housekeeping. So design should be a democratic process. As Guy Bonsieppi has argued, design has now become too entrenched in the spectacle of a media event. Instead of focusing on intelligent solutions, design has, quote, drawn nearer to the ephemeral, fashionable, and quickly obsolete. This has led to the boutiqueization of the universe of products for everyday life. While Bonsieppi does not mention hotels specifically, his argument is certainly applicable as hotel chains like Hyatt redesign their rooms not with design solutions in mind, but with the idea of keeping up appearances that will look fashionable. Bonsieppi wants the design community to move away from this unsustainable model and move towards what he describes as a sense of participation so that, quote, dominated citizens transform themselves into subjects opening a space for self-determination. This ability to creatively instill self-determination is at the heart of Bonsieppi's larger wish for an emancipative type of design that will foster less subjugation in the face of a design establishment 
so enamored with the seductive power of manipulating users with and through design. And one way that I am a, a big fan of in terms of changing some of the nature of the way this works in an industry like the hotel industry, but I think this could be extended into a lot of the topics that i um, focusing on today in terms of housing, is by embracing this idea of, of, of co-design. And Elizabeth Sanders and Peter Jan Strappers describe co-design as a subversion of what designers usually accept as best practices. In co-design, the person who will eventually be served through the design process is given the position of expert of his or her experience and plays a large role in knowledge development, idea generation, and concept development. They still claim that the role of the professional designer is important, but in their model, the designer cannot do his or her job without input from the individuals who will have to utilize the product or system being produced. Sanders and Stappers also understand that the design process is not a linear narrative. Ideas, concepts, prototypes, and products do not come to the fore in a logical way, I think as we all know. However, they claim that with more of an inclusive process, quote, what is being designed will change. Imagine then a scenario at the Hyatt Regency Chicago where housekeepers, management, and potential guests work together to come up with design solutions. This form of co-design could include conversations about the current rooms that raise questions about what design choices work and what design choices could be improved upon. Perhaps, for instance, a housekeeper could explain to Beatrice Gorelli how the weight of the mattress in relation to its placement on a non-flexible bed frame makes it very difficult to change the sheets. In reaction to this, the housekeepers and the designers could come up with novel solutions for different types of mattresses and frames that would enable rooms to look presentable without causing the hardships described by so many of the housekeepers I interviewed. Designers, managers, union organizers, and workers all appear to be having conversations without actually talking to one another. Anne Small Gonzalez, the, one of the housekeepers I interviewed at the Regency, summarized Labor's position eloquently. She said, quote, management doesn't listen to their people. They don't take that into consideration, that people are actually getting hurt from doing what they are doing in these rooms, and that the changes that are made are affecting people's lives. In order to get both sides to listen, changes have to occur that will enable this dialogue to take place. Thinking about design as a democratic process with myriad voices ultimately makes the process more complex but this also has the potential to make the process equitable to both bodies and minds. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here, so thank you, Hilary, for inviting me. At the same time, I'm also slightly embarrassed that uh, what I'm going to tell is uh, extremely frivolous in the light of what we've been discussing so far. Um, it's a kind of uh, wealthy people problem. Um, the rise and sprawl of condo towers in uh, Toronto. As a relatively new arrival in uh, Canada, I've been completely puzzled and surprised by the transformation of Toronto over the last few years. And um, let me see if it works. This is uh, the difference between 50 years, that's a lot, but I can tell you around the turn of the century, most of what you see here was still not built. Um, so I made a book about this with a disclaimer. Uh, now I have three copies of the book, which is perfect for this room. So I will hand them out here, and you can all take a look. If you really like the book, I'm sorry, you can buy it. Don't get a copy there. I'm not expecting one. But uh, what I want to do today is uh, say something about um, this transformation of Toronto with this one particular building type of the condo tower. And um, I know that the book, which I made together with Partisans, an architectural office in Toronto, who is responsible, for instance, for this bar, uh, this book has caused quite a bit of grief and anger among developers and architects, which was surprising to me, um, because the book is simply observing what's going on and it's describing it in a very neutral way, I believe, by making a sort of a catalog. Um, and I'm going to show you part of the catalog. So my first visit to Toronto was in the 1990s, when I thought it was a nice but rather sleepy place. Um, and when I came back, 
six years ago, seven years ago, I found a very exciting, lively, vibrant city. So the paradox for me is that this transformation from mid 70s to this, um, the city has become extremely interesting for its cultural life, for its uh, city life, but the architecture is uh, amazingly bland and uninteresting. And this paradox, exciting on street level, boring as soon as you look up, is something that is the, sub the reason why I decided to make this book. Um, so this overall sameness is, for instance, visible in the exterior colors of um, the buildings, which range from dark gray to light gray and from greenish gray to grayish green. <laughs> and uh, we analyzed this. And here you see a selection of buildings. And you can see that the most adventurous designers of condo towers use a little bit of red and a little bit of green. And that's about it. Um, and it's just one example of the sameness and blandness of these buildings. The city of Toronto uh, has imposed a new system of depicting uh, projects which are in the making. So you have to make this notice board and you have to follow a template for how to depict the building. And it really worked well because it shows this sameness even more and this is of course the perfect example the template for this uh, notice board where you can see that um, it is indeed not very uh, exceptional and in this respect speaking here on a day which is dealing with new paradigms uh, and in a panel which is about design excellence, I think I'm slightly uh, out of place. Um, the sameness is not limited to the design of condo towers, but also to its promotion. And here we see a collection of slogans which are used to promote uh, condo towers, new projects. And the most striking thing here is obviously that architecture is completely absent. Um, they speak about many things, but not about architecture. Um, what is striking as well for me is that um, those buildings, those condo towers are completely interchangeable. They display an amazing indifference to the site and their context, to the city and to its history. Even if they try to include existing architecture, they do it in a way <clears throat> which is only a Potemkin version of history, according to me. Um, the architecture is underwhelmingly present. It falls between the cracks of the spreadsheet at the beginning and the branding strategy at the end which speaks about everything but architecture. And um, here you see how this sameness also is reflected in floor plans, which are extremely small. And in the light of the discussion of this morning, speaking about uh, Mexico, um, the price of one square meter in Toronto is similar to a whole unit in Mexico. And the amount of inventiveness in one square meter in Mexico, I think, is uh, the same as the whole unit here. Um, so we just made a selection of floor plans and put them all together. And I'm just moving forward to what's maybe my favorite uh, part, uh, this so-called one bedroom plus den. A den is, a, in most condo towers, a room without a window which is often used and rented out as a second bedroom. And here you see why some of the small units have two bathrooms to allow for this renting out. There is obviously a, a legal difference between condos and apartments, but this is hard to maintain in Toronto where somewhere between 25 and 40% of all the units which are privately owned are actually rented out. Um, the best category I kept for the end 
is the leftovers in every single uh, building. And these are my favorites by far. In the light of a tradition of 50 years of housing design studio here at this school, I think nobody would get a high pass for anything like this. Um, I have a European background and I don't want to be Eurocentric, but it's striking that some of the best projects so far, um, which are maybe the real exceptions, and they are of recent date, are designed by European, in this case, Danish architects. Where you can see this project is on its way, and the same for two projects by three times N, um, which I believe stand out as much better than the average in Toronto. They are invited because there is an obsession with uh, design excellence, even though it's almost absent in those condo towers. Um, and there is an uh, obsession with branding, and Danish architects work for this uh, idea of branding, and the same is true for Karol Lagerfeld. And this is a particular case where an, exi well, an existing design for a condo tower has got a bit of touch, touches of genius from Karol Lagerfeld, who was asked to design the lobby and one model suite. As you can see here, these are the lobbies. The most important thing was maybe not so much his design, but his presence at the party. Uh, which was really like a big event with great slogans as well. This one is great for someone who's always dressed in black. <laughs> and here we see the master himself in this model suite, which he transformed from a cramped unit into a cramped unit with black and white <laughs> details, which is somewhere like 10 feet wide, and as you can see, at least 10 feet high, which is part of the narrative of branding that you have floor to ceiling luxury if you have anything that's 10 feet high. Um, this is more or less the context in which architecture does not exist, you can say, in condo towers, um, where a loft is an excuse for not properly finishing anything, or uh, an excuse for making units even smaller than they were. Um, in that sense, there is some sort of uh, limitation in the quality of those units. A bit of background, because every novelty makes its causes new. Um, one key moment was the creation of the Condominium Act, the end of the 1960s, which made it possible to sell units uh, or to have shared ownership of land. So there was the first uh, step. The second one was 1995, when there was a referendum on Quebec independence, which was a big thing in Canada, uh, which was rejected by a razor thin majority and which gave enough companies headquartered in Montreal the creeps and then prompted them to move to Toronto. And this was the beginning of this transition from a sleepy town to a bustling city. The third factor is um, Canada mostly escaped the economic crisis uh, with a mix of good luck and uh, smart policy and the proverbial Canadian risk aversion. And uh, it meant that the Canadian real estate market benefited from the crisis elsewhere and it became a safe haven for it parking your capital. And particularly in condo towers, you can see an enormous increase in the value of property from around 150,000 Canadian dollars in 2000 to more than 600 than today. And at the same time, the sizes of the units got smaller and smaller. Um, one of the striking things is what well, you see, one bedroom, two bedrooms, bottom left. Uh, mm, here, you see something striking as well. You see this peak and this graph at the top, people with high income. So basically the inhabitants of condo, uh, those condo towers are single, high income, highly educated people. 
people. This one is striking and deserves more um, of a kind of research, perhaps, is that most of the inhabitants from uh, in condos used to live in detached or semi-detached houses. So this shows, it's an indication at least, that um, it's a return from the suburbs to the city. And the suburban background of many condo dwellers is somehow reflected in what you see in downtown Toronto nowadays. There's the arrival of large chain stores with, uh, uh, which you used to find in suburban malls, but are, are now present in the city as well. So it hints at the suburbanization of the center of Toronto. Then two names collected to this uh, development in a very oblique way, George Baird and Jane Jacobs. Architect and educator George Baird was one of the makers of Vacant Lottery, a special issue of the Design Quarterly of the Walker Art Center, in which he analyzed together with Jack Diamond and uh, Barton Myers the, let's say, the presence of all those vacant lots in the center of Toronto and the possibility to transform them. And this is a drawing uh, right from this special issue, which is a bit ambiguous. It was meant to show that you could actually uh, turn a high rise into a, a dense low rise project. But I think one way of reading it is also to see the other way around, so kind of argument for what happened actually in Toronto recently. The other one, uh, other person that should be mentioned is uh, uh, Jane Jacobs, who left, as you probably all know, she left New York City to continue her work in Toronto in the late 1960s. And uh, she has an enormous reputation in uh, Toronto still today. She's somehow the uh, patron saint of pedestrian urbanism. And uh, in Toronto, they've invented the Jane's Walk one year after she died. And uh, you don't have to be Roman Catholic to see the, let's say, procession-like character of those Jane's Walks. Um, she's always invo often invoked in Toronto whenever a designer wants to prove that they've done something well by saying that she would have proved it. Uh, usually it's about walkability, about neighborhoods and whatnot. But as a firm believer in free markets, I think developers could also claim that what they are doing is something that Jane would have approved of. Um, I'm, let's say, not completely confident in the relevance of some of her uh, statements. Um, and I think they have a sort of slogan-like character. Um, and some of those slogans have become uh, dating conversation material, as you can see here. So I don't know to which extent we can still discuss this seriously in uh, architectural context. Um, George Baird, by the way, completely disagrees with me on this point. He read the book and he said afterwards, um, the book is actually better than I thought it was. I don't know whether it's a compliment or a swipe, but um, that's his. Uh, and he said I was completely wrong about Jane Jacobs. Um, I come to a conclusion. If you um, suspend all disbelief and assume that the free market is working well, then it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the free market does not work well for architecture. Uh, moreover, speaking with several architects and developers before and after writing the book, I noticed that nobody's really happy with the situation. And it seems that everybody feels that they are part of a movie and they are in this Mexican standoff pointing their guns at each other. Um, developers claim that they have to do what the market demands. Uh, real estate agents force them to offer certain things. Architects claim that they have to do what developers demand, and buyers are simply buying what's available, thinking that as long as it looks like everything else, they will be able to sell it with a decent profit at some point. Um, 
For me, as an architectural historian and a critic, I can feel completely um, an outsider in this, uh, unable to influence anything. Um, and I'm not saying that those recent developments by the invitation of Danish architects is leading to anything directly connected to what I'm, I've been saying, but um, there's at least one reason to believe that there is some power in the written word, because shortly after the book was published, uh, a group of architects mentioned in the book gathered with a lawyer to see if there was enough reason to start a libel case against me. Um, I'm extremely happy that the lawyer advised them not to do it, because that's why I'm still here. Um, but it shows that there is maybe some power in making a book and offering a narrative, offering a reading of something which I think is extremely disappointing. Um, with all the money available, I believe that Toronto could do something much better. Thank you. But for the moment, I'd like to start and, and get a little bit academic just for a moment uh, before we reconnect to real life, uh, which your presentations both evoke um, in great uh, detail. And I'd love it if you guys could talk a little bit about your distinct methodologies. I mean, David, you're, you're talking about really an ethnography here um, and using sort of a, an American studies anthropological ethnographic um, a series of processes to, to really unpack uh, the lived experience of, of taking care of these environments. Um, and Hans, as a, as a critic, um, you know, you're, you're talking about this in a context that really um, is in dialogue with a, with a canonical architectural history as well as um, the way in which you've uncovered uh, some of the, you know, the legal things in terms of the Condominium Act and some of the context of specific figures that have left this um, l led to the situation we now see in Toronto. Um, our panel is the only one today that is um, not being sort of the presentation of design propositions or, or planning proposals. Uh, so I'm, as I mentioned in the intro, excited to foreground you know, both storytelling as well as other qualitative experiential methods of inquiry. And you guys are both educators too. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about your own sort of methodologies and also why you think those methodologies are important to teach the designers of the future and how that might influence design education, um, for, especially for those who are considering going on to dealing with some of these you know, social problems that we're hearing about today. Well, for me, uh, I'm trained as an architectural historian, but I also did uh, archaeology. And for mm -hmm. me, this whole idea of uh, uh, classifying things Speak into your mic a little more closely. Classifying, uh, structuring, categorizing things is really helpful to understand what's going on. And um, it, I think it, it worked well in the case of um, those condo towers because um, many times developers and architects suggest that it's uh, uh, highly original what they're doing. <laughs> but if you see it all next to each other, you see they're all the same. And um, we also made a point, as you can see in the book, if it's still going around here, uh, we collected all the statements from architects from their website, all their claims, what they are doing. And I think that's the main reason why they were upset, because if you see all the, let's say, design statements and missions of all the websites together, completely uh, interchangeable. So in that sense, it, it works for me to use this uh, kind of old school uh, archaeological methods of classification mm -hmm. to understand what is going on. I loved the, the emphasis on the marketing slogans as well. There was one that seemed particularly ironic that was like, you, you're not one of a crowd. You uh, make all your own decisions and are a highly original thinker or something <laughs> like that. Like, well, yeah. really? uh, well, my favorite, I don't think we included it, but one of my favorite is uh, uh, a project where they said, uh, this, let's say, this unique selling point was that it was uh, an iconic address. <laughs> <laughs> David, can you speak a little bit about your methods, ethnography, interviews, sure. and, and the role that plays in design education today? Yeah, so uh, my background is in American studies, but I've taught in mostly art history and design history types of contexts. Um, and the work that I did earlier in my career was much more historical, mm -hmm. where I would spend 
the, the hours upon hours in places like the library here, for example, uh, for the project that I did on, on American Empire in the Philippines. Um, and this was a departure, and this was something that I had never done before, the idea of working with um, people who are living mm -hmm. was, a, was a, new, a, a, a new avenue. Um, but being able to interview subjects, I think, brought out elements of design that I had not considered before. You know, so um, part of another part of the project looks at these greenwashing programs that happen in hotels. You know, when you check into a hotel and you're told that you don't need to get your linen changed or your towels changed and they'll give you a hotel credit of some sort, make a green choice, which Starwood and Marriott do is probably the most famous one. Um, you know, and on the surface, there's a progressive element to that, right? You're being conscious of sustainability and you're saving on chemicals, but uh, spending time interviewing housekeepers and hearing about how this led to lost wages mm -hmm. is not something I ever would have learned without actually having um, those conversations, I think. And it, it, it brought an element to the project which surprised me, um, which is always nice when research happens in a way that dealing just with documentation right. did not. Do you find an increased interest on the part of students to, to sort of investigate design environments using that kind of methodology? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, and the idea of interviewing people and uh -huh. having conversations about it um, is definitely something that students are very interested in. And more and more of the students, of the graduate students that I work with are going in that direction. I mean, there's all kinds of complications with things like IRB approval right. and the population that you're working with. Um, and you know whether or not you use uh, inter subjects' names or not, and what mm -hmm. that means. Do you pay subjects? I mean, there's all kinds of ethical issues which I knew nothing about until I started this project, right. quite frankly. Uh, but I learned about. Um, but but students are very interested in following that path. No, and I think it, it should definitely work for a research like mine as well, because um, I always have issues whenever uh, explanations become too abstract when it's mm -hmm. about the market. Right, because that, it's, there's no market. There's just a, a, a collection of individuals, and they all take decisions, and together they lead to something. But it's all individuals. And the funny thing is, as soon as you speak to developers and architects, they're basically complaining about the same things, and they feel forced by something abstract, which nobody can name or touch, yeah. like the market or the economy or uh, <laughs> society. Right. Yeah, well, it, which speaks to the way in which a lot of the buildings you're talking about are not even housing environments in the sense that we've been talking about today, mm -hmm. but are in fact vehicles for speculative capital, you know, which you yeah. raised. But then, then we're also entering again this abstract mm -hmm. level of right. investment in capital and things like that. Which also yeah, is, yeah. is not only a, um, a driver, but it's also an excuse <laughs> to yeah. feel forced yeah. in, into making these kinds of design decisions um, without a tremendous amount of consideration for um, the long term. I mean, another thing I really love about uh, the, the um, overlap between your presentations, which is also would have been very present in, in Dr. Lee's presentation too, had she been able to join us, um, is this notion of, of thinking at a slightly broader time scheme um, about some of the, the questions that you're investigating um, than is necessarily often the case, certainly in terms of architectural criticism where we evaluate um, design excellence only on you know opening day, <laughs> and then immediately thereafter it begins to deteriorate, um, which is why questions of maintenance, questions of stewardship, uh, not only when that's a labor issue, which of course is uh, especially acute in the in the case of you know house cleaning staff in hotels, um, but the way in which we maintain our environments as a form of use, um, I think, is is of crucial importance. Um, as, as we think about all different kinds of environments. So, yeah, how does the role of, of, of time um, or, or the need for long-term inquiry into these complex environments, how do you think that uh, needs to be, you know, to a greater or lesser degree embraced by design studies more broadly? Well, it, it's hard to be against it to start <laughs> with. Uh, well, how, well, then how do you do it? How, how do we yeah. encourage a, a, a longer time frame of analysis? Um, well, I think w one of the, it's so obvious, but one of the, uh, let's say, clear advantages of uh, having a historical perspective of being a historian or whatever, is that you know that many things that are presented as new are actually not new at all. Mm -hmm. So they have a history. And uh, so whenever I hear people speak about uh, a new generation, I'm always suspicious because, okay, what's a new generation? 
Right. Yeah. But so, it's, it's very hard to break out of, I mean, I am teaching an American art class this semester, right? So it's basically American art, architecture, and design, the way I've, I've constructed the class. But, you know, with architecture, you're often, not always, and I try to break out of it, but you're often just showing the, the best version of the right. completed thing um, without actually thinking about how people are construing that space in different ways. It's what's constructed and then that's the snapshot that mm -hmm. you're showing on the PowerPoint and then you move on to the next image. Right. Um, style to style uh, you know, is frequently the mode of doing it. And I think if there's moments where you could break out of that to try to talk about how people actually use the space, obviously that's something that makes things come alive, it makes things come alive for students, but it's difficult to break out of the mode, I speak for myself personally, of sometimes just going building to building or space to space. But yeah, I try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see the, I think another aspect which is important is language. I'm, I'm pretty interested in the language around architecture, the language mm -hmm. around those projects. And I think even the language here, uh, speaking about design excellence is really, really intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's almost like um, um, when you say that uh, if you if you have to emphasize it, then it's absent mm -hmm. apparently. Um, so I um, I had a discussion not oh, too long ago with the former uh, planner uh, from Mont uh, from Toronto, uh, Jennifer Kiesma, and she was speaking about public space in Toronto, and it was all about. Uh, spectacular and uh, design excellence and award-winning and uh, world-class and things like that which for me was extremely telling yeah and uh, it didn't end well the discussion but uh, <laughs> well no I mean because oh, yeah. the way in which the term is most often used is very much as a um, a benchmark or a metric and essentially it was used as a way to in a policy uh, context say well let's actually hire architects <laughs> as opposed to um, creating the same sort of boxes. Uh, um, you know, uh, in the morning session, Tatiana Bilbao mentioned that for you know, two decades, a lot of the social housing in Mexico was uh, you know, yeah. of a very sort of formulaic type. And then the introduction of any kind of architectural concern, even if it is only 1% of the buildings, um, led, led to a different level of conversation and, and, and discourse around that. However, I think you're absolutely right, having to point that out most often just indicates that it's absent. Yeah. No, and of course, there's always an inflation in language, and pff, I don't have any problem with it, but I'm, I'm still waiting for the first uh, city that comes with a planning strategy where they say, we want to make it good. Yeah, yeah and, and Karl Lagerfeld is not necessarily the way to get <laughs> <No>. to, right? <laughs> right? That's what I found amazing about those images that you showed. First of all, the term fashion also came up mm -hmm. in the list of the slogans that you had, um, but the images of you know, Carl creating the lobby and then him in that in that cramped apartment space with those black plates. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seemed very on brand for him, of course, you know, dressed in his typical yeah. attire. Uh, but it, 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 it's about elevating the status of the space, obviously, for the individuals who are buying the apartment. But it's going beyond architectural discourse, right? It has to now become this fashion yeah. idea. Um, which I really found incredible from a marketing perspective of how that's working yeah. in those images. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a whole other level of narrative. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Do you want to do other studies of this kind where you kind of look? I mean, I'm also interested, what you said you mentioned language. I haven't yet had the opportunity to read the book, but the, you said that you described it you know, in a very sort of neutral way, and we're really kind of breaking yeah. it down into <laughs> yeah. these. Um, yeah, no, which I mean, yeah. I was slightly, yeah. I was like, really? Yeah. Is, 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 this, is this a neutral analysis? But I think what you're talking about is that you were, you were deconstructing the elements of the way in which this architectural narrative of a condominium downtown lifestyle is being presented, even though it's a pretty regimented and deterministic yeah. form of city life. No, absolutely. And so one, one chapter in this catalog is that we, what we show are the renderings mm -hmm. of those buildings. And you always see the CN Tower in the background, mm -hmm. which is the only way to know that it's actually in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and if you see them all next to each other, it really becomes funny. It's so yeah. silly that every single image has the CN Tower because it's marketed to people who already are in Toronto in right. most cases. There's a kind of endless repetition. 
So it's, it's not only the language, but it's also the visual language, which right. is uh, so repetitive. Um, and I think it's intriguing. So there may be more subjects, but now I'm a bit longer in Canada, so I'm going to live according to this motto of better safe than sorry. So <laughs> I might be more careful <laughs> in avoiding uh, libel uh, issues. <laughs> Um, speaking of language, David, tell us a little bit more about the, the content of some of the interviews that you conducted with these house cleaners. Was, um, did everyone use very sort of similar language? Was it all about um, sort of inconvenience and time? Or were there other themes that came up that um, perhaps led to a, a way of suggesting we could expand the definition of how we evaluate the quality of a designed environment? Yeah, I mean, it was about, it was a, a lot of the discussions were about time, and a lot mm -hmm. of the discussions obviously were about the difficult nature of the work. I, I was, you know, I'd heard about this, but I was surprised about the number of conversations that led to uh, people talking about injuries, mm -hmm. and that's actually been fairly well documented um, by certain studies, you know, ergonomic studies and other studies that have been done, but hearing about that. Um, and then also a lot of the interviews went into their personal lives. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, I interviewed a, a group of women um, in Hawaii um, where this Make a Green Choice started and actually was then, it's now gone in Hawaii. Um, it's, it still exists in other Starwood Marriott properties, but not in Hawaii any longer as a result of the um, strikes, protests, and, and engagements that these women were involved with who I interviewed. Uh, but they talked about losing um, the inability to send remittances to the Philippines. So for mm -hmm. example, the, women, the housekeepers that I interviewed in Hawaii, all of them were Filipina. Um, and it wasn't, that wasn't just you know, sort, of, sort of a bizarre coincidence. Right. It's, it's who's doing the work in, in Hawaii uh, in, in these hotels. Um, but you know, these long conversations that led to how Make a Green Choice, which I talk about in terms of service design issues and workflow systems and things like that, had other types of ramifications. Uh, to their personal lives, which I never thought yeah. would come up in these interviews. I thought it was only going to really just be about the work and the physical hardship and perhaps the corporeal hardship as well, but I didn't realize that there would be other... I mean, of course, it makes sense that there are, but I was surprised when things like that came up mm -hmm. in the context of the interviews. Uh, and it was very difficult to get to interview um, the housekeepers. I initially tried, when I first started the project, and got IRB approval, I stood outside the service entrance of the Waldorf Astoria and waited for the women to come out of the hotel and I handed them my little flyer that I had IRB approval for saying, you know, can I interview you? And I got the most suspicious looks, you know, <laughs> basically, who's this white guy? Like, yeah. there, you must be a union mole. Why would we possibly speak to him? And so the interviews that I did, and I talk about this in the, in the book, um, were, were absolutely uh, set up by the union. And so it's important to put that, yeah. you know, on, on the table that that actually was was part of the issue, which um, perhaps speaks to why you know injury and wages. I mean, those these absolutely. are very much determined. Yeah, and, and so there labor. were certain conversations that happened where I heard the same mm -hmm. tropes, but yet at the same time there was evidence that was presented to me that that was really right. going on. But I had to be very aware of um, how it was that I was able to speak to yeah. the folks that I was speaking to as well. I wonder. I mean, I'm just very curious. You know, since. Hans, and it, it does in the some of the data you showed towards the end of the presentation about you know those very interesting where what kinds of apartments people lived in prior to living in some of these downtown condos. Um, did you speak to any residents? I spoke to residents, yes, uh, and but on an anecdotal basis, so it's it's not mm -hmm. enough to to draw any conclusions. Um, but it seems to uh, uh, promote a kind of anonymous lifestyle. Uh -huh. So. It, if I'm visiting friends and if you meet somebody in the elevator, there's never any any contact. Right. So it, people seem very introverted living there. And that's maybe further proof of this continuation of this suburban lifestyle where you just shop for the whole week and then your groceries mm -hmm. take them home and you stay in your own bubble. Um, yeah, it seems to be part of that kind of global aesthete, you know, that you're tapping into this luxury lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, that also often has to do with kind of detachment and a sense of cool in those spaces, and I think. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, but but there's, there's another aspect to it, which I think is also interesting, and it's kind of relating to your subject as well, is that um, in the past, running a household was an activity, and right. now everything is just effortless and seamless. And uh, in every promotion of housing nowadays, you see people 
just having a great time. You never see anything which is remotely uh, connected to chores. Right, the work is invisible. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. Carl, sure. Carl will even yeah. set your table. Yeah. No, that's uh, in your case as well. In the yeah. hotel, it's, uh, they, they go to great efforts to, to so make it completely invisible. Absolutely. Um, we have about five minutes left. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Right here, sir. Uh, so there's a certain point of view that would uh, sort of link both of your presentations, and that's the financing point of view. Uh, so there's this, you know, uh, any project gets financed, and it's it's a these kind of projects certainly are money making. Uh, the motivation is to make make money, and there's a narrative for each one of the projects like this that's that's provo that's uh, written for the bank to convince them that this is a safe investment, that they'll make their money back. And uh, I used to write those <laughs> narratives. So uh, I know something about them. And uh, on a hotel project like this, it's uh, called the Property Improvement, uh, uh, a PIP, Property Improvement uh, Plan. And it's supposed to include everything that changes. So it's supposed to include the schedule of the construction, it's supposed to include any changes to the room, uh, because the cost is supposed to be justified in terms of the revenue. Right. So anything in terms of uh, actually changing labor cost or, or labor demands, you know, theoretically should be in that plan and somebody should have evaluated. So you may want to look into that no, that's for future a great, research. That's a great suggestion. If I could get my hands on them, though, that's right, the only right. That, that sounds they're like usually, a complicated Yeah, they're usually archive. like, from, go from the developer to bank, so you, you know. Uh, and in the case of the condos, so we used to write these reports, they would be very, you probably won't be surprised that they're very different for an apartment building that's supposed to be a rental, uh, you know, single owner, versus an apartment building that somebody develops to sell to one owner to rent, versus an apartment building where it's all condos. And the condos, because they're sort of mass market, instruments are the ones that are sort of um, have the least risk because there's, they're easiest to sell and they also tend to be the lowest quality because the people who are buying them are, in the, in, are in the, uh, not in a position really to evaluate uh, what they're buying. So if you're buying a whole building, if you're an owner and you want to rent them out, you have your own experts uh, you know, to evaluate everything, the physical plant. But if you're a condo, you know, buyer, you just sort of buy based on what you know. Yeah. My question to you is, did you look at, and maybe it's in your book, but I haven't read your book, before, but I will buy it. Um, <laughs> right. So two deals, like two deals. Um, did you look into the source of the money, particularly in the uh, well, mostly in the condo, I would assume, and in the rental um, developments, as far as their, are there being transnational um, capital? Yeah, it is and, transnational, yeah. And was there a, something that jumped out of you? You expected the, uh, the results of your findings, and could you speak a little bit more to that? Um, it, it's really hard to get exact numbers on this uh, transnational uh, uh, money. What seems to be clear is that a lot of the money is coming from outside Canada, and there is a kind of uh, anecdotal suggestion that a lot of it is coming from China, uh, which has led to a kind of uh, 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 field uh, racism in Canada, in Vancouver and in Toronto, saying that Chinese are buying everything. Um, so it seems that they, uh, there are parties that are buying uh, uh, large chunks of units in single buildings, single towers, so let's say 25, 40 units or something like that, uh, as an investment, and they rent it out, uh, blurring the distinction between an apartment and, and a condo. Um, but there are no, let's say, clear uh, figures for the exact amount of money that is uh, flowing into the market. 
but it's certainly driven by foreign investment. You, does you, Toronto have a, a second home or a vacant home tax? I mean, Vancouver does have a version of that. Um, I don't know. I cannot give you an answer to that. But that would be interesting yeah. to, to track, the because yeah. that's a recent thing, that in two cities that both have a yeah. huge proliferation of condominium towers. I know um, it's in it's Vancouver, a, but I'm, I'm yeah. not sure if it's... it's there was also a, a, the New York Times two or three years ago. They had a series of articles about who was actually owning, who actually owned apartments in the Time Warner condos, and really delved into the LLCs that are buying yeah. those spaces. And it was a great investigative report. You should do that. Yeah. Well. Now, what <laughs> I, what I know is that uh, the developer of this uh, project by Big in uh, uh, Toronto, they have on their website. Uh, I think it's on their website even. Uh, at least they have a, an overview of their international offices. And they're all in Asia. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Does Canada have the equivalent or the, uh, something similar to the EB-5 visa program in the United States? Yes. It does. Do you ever think about how buildings age? Uh, you know, in this city, for example, some buildings have aged very well, like the UN building or uh, um, uh, 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 the Chrysler building. Um, some of age very poorly, like the original McGraw-Hill building. I don't know if any of you remember that, but, <laughs> but that one won a ton of a design awards when it was first built. You look at it today and it's a piece of garbage. Um, the second question is, um, um, uh, you've all heard of the rubric form follows function. Uh, 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 the, 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 the function of the buildings you, 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 you're describing, of the hotels, for example, is for the customers, you know, for the customer to, to, to you know, have a good experience and hopefully come back to live in that hotel. Um, uh, how, you, 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 how do you blend the two, uh, the form and, and the function of designing a bed? Uh, you're not designing it so as to break the arms of the cleaners. No. You're designing it to be maximally comfortable for the customer. Absolutely. And, and the third question, is, so I think the most important, is um, in, in the mid-'80s, approximately into the 90s, there was a whole field of the anthropology of architecture where they uh, uh, talked about how uh, the design encourages, uh, our design of our habitat encourages uh, uh, social cohesion, uh, encourages people to live together. Um, um, there was, a, you know, in that uh, the bunch of photographs you had during the intermission, there was one of a public housing project um, it had 360 on it, that was the address. Uh, and there were two people chatting in front of it. And you could you could see how poorly designed that was, you know, how, how, how people have to adapt to their environment. You know, you're going to socialize no matter how poorly you design your buildings. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the design could facilitate that socialization rather than restrict it. And I was wondering if, if, if that is part of the, your analysis of, of, of how uh, uh, buildings are, are, are designed, because I don't, I don't see that literature anymore. I saw a lot of it, um, um, you know, Ask Newman's Dimensional Space, uh, Barry Greenby's Spacious Dimensional Human Landscape, but I don't see that question addressed anymore today. And I, and I was wondering if you think about it at all. I, yeah, it's a, it's a really, those are great questions. I, I, and I agree that the way these hotel rooms are designed is absolutely for the customer. Uh, and that's in part my point. I think if there was a way in which it was still designed for the customer, still designed so that the bank would get its money back as well, um, yet also brought in workers to be part of that conversation, I think there could be very small design maneuvers, design actions that could make it much more reasonable on to workers to work in those spaces, but yet customers could still be happy. You know, in terms of the cost and the bank issue that was brought up as well, um, my contention but is, but this guy was talking about the PIPs. Uh, that, that's an analyzable question. Uh, it is an analyzable question, but the amount of money that sometimes is spent on, on labor conflict actually interferes with the profit that the banks would get. And if there was some allowance for a conversation between these different folks about to use these spaces and clean these spaces and also be guests in these spaces and also manage these spaces and also own these spaces, I think it could potentially stop a lot of the labor conflict that exists all over the hotel industry today. I think, I mean, part of the, the, um, the discourse and the literature that you're referencing, sir, is environment behavior research, you know, which, uh, and some of the, the people that you invoked, um, come out of that tradition of environmental psychology and the way in which that was applied to post-occupancy evaluation of particularly social housing environments in the United States in the 60s and 70s. And while you're right that that is sort of less in vogue now than it was then, I think some of the vanguard 
I mean, you mentioned service design, you mentioned co-design, um, and, the, and the sort of who are we incorporating into the ways in which we think about design environments. Those, I think, are um, resurgences Absolutely. of some of that spirit of how can we actually bring, to, bring some of these social scientific and psychological insights into the ways in which we look at patterns of use without necessarily um, kind of recommitting the crimes of overly deterministic uh, environments where, you know, I mean, defensible space uh, chief among them um, that kind of preordain how people are going to actually use their environments. And in fact, if we look at use, uh, we find that even some, you know, I'm sure there's a, I'm sure that the diversity of the ways in which these homogenous environments of Toronto are actually used based on the demographics of who's living there and what that could tell us about different household compositions and different kinds of, you know, migration patterns. I mean, there's a lot of more nuance in laid onto these homogenous environments that I think it takes a lot of work and it takes ethnographic work and design criticism work um, as well as other kinds of competencies to unpack those forces. And so I think that's one Who of the things. That work? Is it the planners? Is it the architect? Is it the uh, uh, <laughs> Who does that? Um, not enough of us, I think, <laughs> is the answer. But, uh, but yes. <laughs> uh, but definitely, I think it is on the rise, certainly in the, in the pedagogy um, that we're involved in here. I think you're seeing increasing um, interest on the part of students of architecture to look at some of those post-occupancy questions. I don't know if design studies and if, if Daniel's faculty, if you see similar trends in this terms is, of- Yeah, what we're yeah, doing yeah. at Parsons, absolutely, mm -hmm. hopefully. But we'll continue to do more of it. So I think that wraps us up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.